It's safe to say that no matter who you supported for president this year, the idea that the other side might win is unsettling. Both sides have described this as a battle for the soul of America. Both sides see the other side as somewhat soulless. But if we're going to stay in this relationship as Americans, how are we going to come together again? How are we going to see each other as neighbors, not enemies? A broken marriage needs wise counsel. A broken country needs a wise plan. Today on State of Independence, I'm going to introduce you to a man who's been working on a blueprint, not a new idea, but a plan that encourages a return to some timeless ideas, the importance of home and marriage and family and community and church. I know this is going to be a great conversation. That's next on State of Independence. What happens next? That's the question many of us are asking about the American experiment that begins here in Philadelphia with a dream that we are created by God, that we are granted equality and rights because of God, and with those rights come responsibilities to ourselves, to our neighbors, and to our communities. Can Americans survive the battle of words and the war of ideas? My guest, Tim Gagline, has spent three decades in Washington, D.C. He's a Hoosier who worked for a U.S. Senator and President George W. Bush in the White House, and he's been thinking and writing a lot about the dual responsibilities of people in, of faith as citizens of a country, the United States, and citizens of heaven. He argues that an America that's connected to our founding values is still the best way to heal the schism that's ripped deep tears into the fabric of our country. He believes that by embracing Judeo-Christian ethics, fewer Americans will be on the outside looking in. But first, watch this. Every American seems to agree. It can't go on like this much longer. The fracturing of society along religious, political, economic, education, and social fault lines. The truce that once held between New York, Hollywood, and the vast country in between is coming unglued. No longer whispered, the fight is in city streets and in the front lawns of polite neighborhoods. Former presidential aide and co-author of American Restoration, Tim Gagline, points to one overriding principle rooted in ancient scripture that forms the basis for unity, the way back, imago Dei, translated in the image of God. Understanding this idea, says Gagline, is the answer to finding American unity, the idea that each life is created with intrinsic value, worth, and meaning. Each life demands dignity, respect, and honor. Can a new generation of Americans grasp this principle in time? Or is it too late? Tim, thanks for joining us today. It's just a, a delight to have you. Uh, my, my daughter, Tiffany Watkins, who worked with you in the White House, uh, is so delighted that you're on the show and, and uh, wishes she could be here as well just to greet you again. Uh, but thanks for, for joining us. And, Joe, uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Now, I, I know that you're uh, in, in D.C. today, uh, and I know that uh, every, every day is a busy day for you, given the work that you have. Uh, and, but you've traveled a lot around the country, and, and, and you, you talk to Americans all the time. What is the temperature of Americans right now, and, and especially among people of faith? Would you say that fear is winning or is faith winning? You know, I have to be very candid with you. Uh, it depends on the day of the week. Uh, I hear at some gatherings despair and discouragement and discontent, Joe, uh, and at other gatherings, I hear people who want to organically, uh, you know, be incorrigible optimists. You know, they're Americans. We're Americans. Uh, they're looking ahead. They want the best thing. But I have to tell you over and over and over again, uh, and this is a center uh, part uh, of American Restoration, the book that you mentioned, uh, there's this uh, Lincoln-esque idea directly from scripture, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think we are testing that proposition uh, in the 21st century. And I think people of faith will have a lot to say uh, about whether uh, we can find a way to close uh, what seem to be unbridgeable chasms, uh, or whether we are going to continue along this trajectory of what you outlined uh, when this uh, wonderful segment began. Uh, and we're, we, we're going to find out, I think, uh, fairly soon. Well, a lot of people, of course, have ideas uh, about this. Uh, 
uh, it, and they talk about their ideas to, to heal the divide, but most of them are just uh, interested in, in, uh, in really in beating the other side. I mean, you know, I, I talk to people all the time, just like you do, and they just want to win, uh, beat the other side. So, so, so I, I know you have a much different sense of things. What, tell me what's different about, about this great book that you've written, that you've co-authored. Well, may I say, I do have a different view, because as a Christian, I am a hopefulist, and I believe very strongly that the best days for the United States of America are definitively ahead of us. And Joe, I was so heartened to read that major study of just 10 days ago that surveyed young people in America who overwhelmingly are optimistic about the country and optimistic about their own futures. So I take heart from that. Uh, I think that the seedbed of my book, American Restoration, is the following, uh, that if we are going to have regeneration, renewal, restoration in this country, it's not going to happen because people in Washington, uh, you know, uh, enforce something top down or Hollywood or the Silicon Valley or Wall Street. It's going to happen organically. In other words, if we're going to have an American restoration, and I believe that we will, that sense of restoration will come at the local level. It will begin in our neighborhoods, in our churches, uh, and in those close-knit groups that have always uh, been the defining characteristic of the United States of America. Now, you, you tell a story, uh, Tim, about a school principal who asks you about the one thing that you'd add to her school to make it better. Uh, what, what did you tell her? And, 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 and tell me why it matters. Well, I, I believe very strongly uh, that it, it's very important beginning in the youngest of ages. In fact, I would say uh, college and even high school is too late. We have to begin uh, teaching civility, grace, magnanimity, and we have to pair that and twin that with the idea of patriotism and good citizenship. What does it mean uh, to be producing you know, the next generation of good citizens, good patriots? You know, in some quarters, Joe, uh, these are now considered fighting words, and they shouldn't be. Uh, the American experience is not a perfect experience. The American experience uh, leads to an exceptional country, but through a lot of hairpin curves. And I think that we have to imbue in the rising generation of young people uh, that we need them more than ever to be good citizens, to be good patriots, and to participate uh, in this time, uh, you know, restoring our country. Our country uh, needs us, and never more than now as people of faith. So uh, I, I guess um, I can hear some of the people uh, uh, talking about the people that you've written about. You've written about some great Americans, some great uh, people in history, uh, you know, Madison, Jefferson, uh, uh, Washington, uh, great names, uh, our founding fathers as we, as we have called them in the past. And, uh, and then there'd be some people that would say, well, you know, you talk about these people, but, but what you're really doing is kind of glossing over the, the more complicated side of, of, of history. You know, how, how do you reconcile uh, some of the challenges uh, in the lives that they actually led? I mean, they, they, they spoke great ideals, they aspired to, to, to a great country and to a free country, but they didn't always live it. So, so how, do you, how do you reconcile that? Well, first, I'm, I'm thrilled by that question because I think that the idea of what connotes a great country uh, is never the same thing as what is a perfect country. You know, those of us who are honored to carry the name of Christ know uh, that we are all fallen. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so if we begin the expectation for any individual uh, or any country with perfection, it seems to me we will always be disappointed. Um, I was speaking actually just a few days ago uh, in Georgia, uh, and one of the people, uh, after my remarks, raised his hand, uh, not to ask a question, but to make, I think, a, a really salient point, Joe. Uh, he said that if you're ever asked to be the citizen of a perfect country, uh, you ought to go to another country because that country doesn't exist. <laughs> and I think that's right. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the founding fathers, the framers, uh, those of the mid-19th century, uh, those of the early 20th century, even this complicated 21st century, uh, we can have incredibly great leaders uh, and we can have incredibly failed leaders. We have to distinguish, however, between uh, what is right reason, what, is, what, what are the virtues, what is the moral excellence uh, worth pursuing, and those things which in our past uh, are worthy of saying we didn't do it right, that's the wrong way forward. And American restoration, I think, makes this distinction. And we have to be honest 
with this generation uh, who I think are deserving of the best that is in us. Tell me the hearing that you get uh, for some of the old fashioned uh, ideas that you're that you're that you're you're sharing with folks, you know, uh, a family, uh, uh, faith, um, uh, marriage. I mean, th these are old fashioned ideas, great ideas, by the way, because 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 they're all important to me uh, in, in my life. But but how do you how do you do that without having a, a spiritual or moral awakening? And, and, and then and then what do you see out there that gives you hope? Uh, I'll tell you what gives me hope is that when I speak to young people, which I do all the time, the number one thing they tell me, Joe, is the following. They say, I want to be married. They say, I want to have children. Uh, they say, I want to live a life of meaning and purpose. They say that they want to devote them lo their, their lives to something uh, bigger and better than themselves. I mean, what more would you want to hear? I think that that's absolutely exceptional. You know, there are people, I think, who realize that discouragement and despair is a sin because it negates the hope of Jesus Christ. It negates the whole idea of hope, you know, and I believe very firmly, as strongly as possible, uh, that, that, that in fact, we have to uh, engage with the younger generation. Uh, many of them have lived through years and years of brokenness. And we have to, to go tell a new generation uh, the reality of the best institutions that we have. And marriage, family, and parenting are three of the great institutions. Going back to your previous question, they're not perfect institutions. God places us in marriages, families, and parenting uh, not, to, not, not always 100% of the time to be happy, but because 100% of the time we are human. And it's a wonderful way to build a good life. I can hear people breathing a sigh of relief there, Tim, when you said you know, about the happiness part. You bet. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I, know, you know, I, I, I want to pick up on that for just a moment, if I may. I think this is one of the problems, uh, that we have a whole generation of young people, and they have grown up in very difficult uh, family situations or domestic situations. They have seen a lot. They have witnessed a lot. And when someone comes to them to tell them about uh, the beautiful uh, you know, uh, uh, idea of marriage or family or parenting, they often take their own experience and say, if that's what you mean, that's not what I want. I think what we have to do is share with them uh, that as flawed and fallen human beings, there is a way to build a life together, to do life together. Yeah. Uh, finding that one other person, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, whom God intended you uh, to marry and to spend a life, uh, building a life with. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful in this regard. I think this generation wants that, and in larger numbers than we may think. Yeah, that's, that's wonderfully hopeful, uh, Tim. I, I love that you're saying that. I, I, um, you know, you and I have a shared experience. We both worked in the White House for U.S. presidents. You know, when people see people like us, they, they, they don't know if we're real. I mean, because uh, uh, so few people get a chance to do what, what we what we're blessed to have the opportunity to do and to, and to serve. Um, and, and they figure that people like us, you know, like, you know, we say one thing when we're out in public talking to Christian folks, but, but in reality, it's much different. Is there any story that you can share that's hopeful to folks about your time in the White House? Uh, anything that you saw that, that, that you can share with, with folks that will, 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 will uplift them? My friend, I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be asked that. You know, for all the extraordinary successes of the White House, I also had profound failure. Uh, I had moral failure, character failure. Uh, it wasn't someone else's fault. It was my fault. Uh, and, uh, and I embraced it. Uh, it was very important uh, that I realized uh, that, uh, that, that, I, that I could do it better. Uh, and I went uh, and, and confessed what I did. I was forgiven by the president. And that sense of forgiveness, grace, mercy, reality, uh, you know, is, uh, is the way forward. Uh, you know, the American people want people who have failed to get up, dust yourself off, and do it better. They, you know, we want our fellow Americans to succeed, but we want in humility uh, for those who have made mistakes or failures to confess them, to say, I could do it better, and I want to do it better. You know, I, I learned, uh, Joe, uh, and, I, and I, I know I'm speaking to a lot of people, uh, you know, I learned uh, that failure is the thing that introduces you to yourself, not success. And it's how you come back from failure. It's what you realize, realize about yourself, about your heart, about your soul. Uh, and, uh, and I think that forgiveness is very good for the soul. And it's a wonderful way to start again. And I, I think we all believe and should believe 
uh, in second chances. You know, that's the way forward for the kind of restored country and culture and civilization that we want in the United States of America, it seems to me. Oh, wonderfully said, uh, Tim Gaglon. In, in closing, um, as we move into the season, season after the election and, and we head toward inauguration, um, are, are you hopeful or optimistic about this moment in history? I'm very optimistic. You know, I never bet against America. This is a country that went through a major revolution. It's a country that went through two world wars. It's a country that went through the Great Depression, the Great Recession, the social and moral upheaval of the 1960s and 70s, a country that realized that Vietnam was a failure. Uh, we saw a president, Richard Nixon, for the first time ever, resign and fly away in a helicopter from the South Lawn. Uh, and there were lots and lots of people who had a heavy heart over that. They thought the country was done, finished. Uh, that's just not the way it is. You know, uh, a nation like ours uh, is not defined by its uh, failures and its low moments. It's defined ultimately, in my view, by an Abraham Lincoln-esque sense uh, that this country will never be destroyed from outward forces. It could only fall from a house divided. And that's why I believe that we have to become a house united. We have to be able to realize that it's not bad manners to disagree with someone else or bad manners to have a different worldview. I think it's how we engage and how we seek uh, to persuade other people to share our worldview or at least part of it and to move together in a healthy way, because that's the kind of citizenship that gives us a very strong country. Tell uh, our viewers again the name of your book so they can run out and get it, because I know they'll want to, want to read this. You're very kind. It's called Simply American Restoration. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, everybody who uh, is viewing or listening uh, will uh, get a copy and I hope be inspired, but also see that there are actually practical ways to restore our great nation. And I hope they enjoy the book. Uh, thank you so much, Tim Gagline. Well, this is a remarkable and resilient country, and you are a remarkable and resilient man. Thank you for being with us today on State of Independence. It's such a pleasure, Joe. Be of good cheer, and thank you. Take care. God bless. We'll be right back. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. Welcome back. Joining me is Norris Clark, a longtime communications strategist and a person who has spoken out frequently about the importance of personal character in the lives of our leaders. Not perfection, but character, a true north that they return to after failure or during testing. Now, Norris, there are lots of people who hear this conversation and are pretty uncomfortable with the proximity of faith uh, to political power or leaders. Some even see it as a manipulative tool. How do you see that? Well, you know, especially since the last uh, debate, uh, you're, we're all scratching our heads and asking ourselves, you know, have we lost some basic core competencies when it comes to communicating as a country, you know? Yeah. And I hear a lot of people uh, saying, you know, times have changed. Yeah. And they question whether the old timeless truths and, 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 and principles really, whether they've left the coast uh, or not. And, uh, you know, some people say, you, you can't talk like Reagan, you can't talk like Lincoln, you can't communicate like Washington anymore because either there's no more Lincolns, the Lincolns have left, or the old principles of communication have changed. And I don't believe that's true. I believe that there are some timeless principles when it comes to communications. And uh, I really see three things that are, that are key. The first is civility. I mean, that's just baseline, a baseline principle that we have as a country. You know, the first president of the United States was the most successful politician we've ever had. Elected twice, virtually no opposition, almost everybody voted for him. He wrote one book. It was called The Rules of Civility. And that book had one key principle. You do not denigrate your opposition. You treat them with respect in the public square. So that was a fundamental principle that guided our elected leaders through Lincoln, through Roosevelt, through Reagan, through Bush, through Clinton, all the way through the, the President Obama, there were certain basic principles of civility that we believed that we had to hold to. Now, the, our current president 
has written a book. It's called The Art of the Deal. And the principle there is that it's perfectly wise and okay to denigrate your competition, den denigrate your opposition. So this is a fundamental shift in the way that we've, we look at communicating uh, in, in America. It's and we, we, we talk to people all the time, I'm sure you have as well as, as I have, that, that say that you know, that doesn't really matter to them anymore. You know, that, you know, uh, you see the, the campaign ads and not just for the presidential race, but for Senate and House races yep. and governor seats. And, and, and they're pretty brutal. I mean, yep. people, there, there's very little in the way of civility yep. in, in these ads. I mean, it's all about how you can tear down, point out whatever is negative about your opponent and, and magnify it so that people won't vote for that person. Right. And civility used to be a baseline, but it really focuses on, you know, how we speak and how, we, uh, how courteous we are. But the second principle that we've got to remember is that, that people recognize, we, they want us to speak from our hearts. They want to hear the truth from our hearts. And the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. Okay, so it's, it, lately in politics, people have said, you know, I'd rather have honest hatred than fake civility. They've looked at some of the previous politicians and said, you know, it's fake civility. It's not really honest. It's not really sincere. And I'd rather have honest hatred. And I have never heard so many people say they hate the other side as they do now. I've never heard it. You know, I, I've lived through the 60s. I've lived through lots of political strife. And I'm not even sure that, you know, during the Civil War, there was as many people saying they hate the other side. I just hate them. They're evil. They are absolutely evil. How do we change that? I mean, con considering where we are and, and the fact that it just seems to be getting more intense yep. as opposed to, how do, we, how do we change that? Joe, we have to see citizens as neighbors, okay? And this is where we have to go back to 1 Corinthians 13, and we have to say, listen, that passage that talks about love is talking about neighbors, okay? And citizens are neighbors. All right, and once we remember that citizens are neighbors and that we have an obligation to love them and read what that means in 1 Corinthians 13, that changes the whole game, okay? And so it's, it's, it's when people realize that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, that's the kind of love that enabled Ronald Reagan to forgive John Hinckley. Okay, think about that. Mm. He, he, he was shot by that man, he forgave him. And when I think about forgiveness and when I think about love, I think about, I've just been reading Unbroken, the story of Louis Zamperini, yeah. Olympic star, right. goes off to fight in the war. And he ends up in a against concentration the, camp. Ends right. up in a concentration camp. Brother, there is no person who was treated any worse on this planet than what Louis Zamperini went through. And he was, there was this degradation of the worst possible degree. He came back, he gets married, uh, he had terrible nightmares. He couldn't let it go. The, the, the hatred was, was completely consuming him. And finally, his wife said, listen, honey, I want you to come to a Billy Graham crusade. And he becomes a Christian, finds forgiveness, and goes back to Japan and forgives the people that had kept him in, in the concentration camp all those years. Okay, and so there's so many examples of that but it's, it all comes from seeing your fellow citizens, even your enemies, as a neighbor. That's the key, okay? We've stopped that. Right. We've now said it's okay to completely hate our enemies and denigrate them. And I'd say the final thing is really we, as a country, have to be willing to share a common story about who we are. So, you know, when, when we got around to, you know, our four forebears were gathering around the, the campfire and they had just gotten what they needed for security and they got, and they've hunted and gathered, they got their food. They gathered around the campfire. You know what they did? They told stories about why we exist as a group. And they shared that with their children. And there's no organization that's ever existed, no community, no corporation, no church, no country that's ever existed without having a common story that they share with each other. So what's the American story, okay? The American story is once upon a time, the creator of the entire universe made us all equal. And it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what gender you are, we are all equal, but something went wrong. And we lost that equality. 
And we are now embarked on this journey to a city shining on a hill to reclaim the equality that we all had as children of God. Okay, that is the story, endowed by your creator with certain yeah, inalienable, inalienable rights. rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the equality that we have is our lives given by God, our, our, our liberty, our choices that we make, and the pursuit of happiness, okay? And that makes all of us equal, no matter our color, no matter our gender, no matter our age, no matter our handicap, we're all equal. And, but that's a journey and a struggle that we are as a country going through. And it, it, we will never completely get there, but we are on this story together. That is the story of America. That is the story that's animated everybody from Washington through to Lincoln, through Roosevelt, through Reagan, up to our current day. And if we lose that story, and it is being lost, not everyone shares that story. If we lose that story, as your previous guest said, we will become a house divided and we will fall. And it is always the fundamental story that, that, that creates that common core of who we are and explains why we are here. Well, at the base of it all, again, is what you said, and so importantly, that uh, we're supposed to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. And, and if we can never get back to that, if we can never get back to that, as divided as we may be today, uh, America will, will, will continue to be headed in the direction of being that city on a shining hill. Yeah. And that, that's, that's my hope, and I know your hope for this country. Yeah. Yeah. Norris Clark, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be right back. Share what you've learned on today's program by first connecting with Joe directly on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Get started at joewatkins.net. We're joined now by our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Great show. Fascinating to think about. We're going to Thanksgiving and uh, the implications of coming together after an election. And we're going to do it one of two ways. We're going to keep the food fight going from before and during, after the election, or it's going to end. I, I like what Norris was saying. He was saying that, you know, we have to see each other, uh, each other as neighbors. Yes. You know? I mean, we're citizens. We're also neighbors. And if we consider that we're neighbors one of another, that you know, maybe we can learn to love each other again. And what about treating our family as neighbors? <laughs> I mean, <that's, laughs> I it starts there. It's going to be a tough year, but we'll get through it with uh, God's help. Absolutely. Well, thank you for making time to be with us on State of Independence. I hope that in some way today's show has helped you in your own life to learn how to trust God more deeply, to love your neighbor more fully, and to become a bright light in the darkness. As someone made in God's image, I hope you'll let that light shine right where you're at. If you have a minute, drop me a line in the comment box at joewatkins.net. I see every one of them and I'll respond. Special thanks to Tim Gagline, Norris Clark, and for you. Until next time, God bless you and thanks for watching. Do you have Thanksgiving plans? What's uh, I think uh, my daughter Courtney's mother-in-law is going to have us over for an Easter. That's what I think. Okay. okay. That's the plan. Okay. So. Do you bring something? Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.